Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Digitalization in Challenging Times, How Your FinServe Company Can Stay Competitive and Efficient. Thanks so much for joining us on the webinar today. This event is presented in partnership with our friends at Split. Before we get started, there's a few things that you should know about the format of the webinar. Uh, first off, uh, my name is David Davis of Actual Tech Media, and I'll be serving as the host. We want these events to be educational, and we encourage your questions there in the questions pane of the audience console. We'll be doing a live Q&A session at the end of the event, so keep those questions coming. We also have a best question prize, which I'll talk about here in just a moment. But first, I want to call your attention to the handouts tab. It's there that you'll find a link to book a demo with Split to start your free 30-day trial, as well as the FinServe ebook and the WePay case study. Those are all uh, excellent resources I encourage you to check out here during the event. Uh, make sure that you spend some time to book a demo with Split, and I think you'll see how valuable this solution can be for you and your company. At the end of the webinar, I'll, I'll be announcing the winner of our Amazon $300 gift card. If you're watching this on demand, recorded, of course, the drawing has already occurred. The prize terms and conditions can be found there in the handouts tab. And then I also have a best question prize for an additional $50 Amazon gift card. This is for the person who posts the best question here in the questions tab on the live event. We'll be contacting the prize winner after the event via email. All right. And so with that, I'm now excited to bring in today's expert presenters. Ariel and John, it's great to have you on. Take it away. Uh, thank you for having us, David. And it's great being on uh, on, on one of these again. Um, so, you know, happy to be here uh, one more time. So today we're going to be talking about uh, digitalization in challenging times. So how your FinServe company can stay competitive and efficient. Um, to introduce ourselves, you know, I'm Ariel Perez. I'm the VP of Engineering uh, for Experimentation and Measurement at Split. Um, I'm in charge primarily of the area of the house that focuses on metrics, impact, measurement, experimentation, and powering your feature flags and powering your learning through data and, and that powerful combination of feature flags and data. My team's focus on building that stuff up. Uh, here with me, we also have John, uh, our, our CFO. So John, uh, over to you. Thank you, Ariel. Um, hello, everyone. My name is John Capaletti. I'm the Chief Financial Officer of Split, and I've been with the company for a little bit over four years, and my focus is really in finance and operations, and my background has been across both, um, you know, Fortune 500 companies as well as startups. And with that, I'd love to, to dig in, and, and maybe what we'll first talk a little bit about is, you know, the state of the economy. Um, as I think we've all sort of read in the headlines um, and have also experienced is that the, the, the economy is shifting, right? And um, before we talk a little bit about what we might expect to see in, in 2023, let's maybe talk a little bit, go down memory lane and talk a little bit about, well, how did we get here, right? Um, and, you know, as we step back to, you know, the, the financial crisis of 2008, um, after that um, crisis, you know, we had a really prolonged and relatively stable economic growth. You know, over the last 10 plus years, we had uh, interest rates that were near zero. Um, you know, since 2009, we had uh, gross domestic product, for instance, was growing um, relatively, you know, in a stable manner from about a percent and a half to 3%, you know, year on year. Uh, unemployment rates were falling from a high of around 10% back in 2010 uh, to less than 4%, right, uh, in 2019. So that's basically uh, at full employment. Um, and you also had inflation, right? That was a plus or minus 2%, you know, in that 10-year period. And so when you kind of looked back at that, that era, you know, it really was in, in a way sort of what they call a Goldilocks economy where you have stable growth, low unemployment, and low inflation. Um, and in that era, you know, there was, relatively speaking, a low cost of borrowing. You had relatively cheap money. And what you ended up seeing was is that investors were chasing, you know, yield um, and, and investing in more riskier assets. So you saw valuations, for instance, increase. 
um, across all asset classes, both equity stocks as well as commodities, real estate, you know, and crypto. Uh, and then the pandemic hit, right? Um, and that had a, a pro profound impact on, you know, demand um, versus supply in the market. And so you had effectively demand dropping off of a cliff. Uh, and uh, with that, you know, uh, both uh, the monetary stimulus that we saw from the Fed, as well as a massive fiscal stimulus was injected into the economy to, to address that hole in demand. Um, and, and from that, you know, you saw asset prices um, inflating as the cost of capital was cheap. cheap. And as the, as the economy reopened, uh, that demand overwhelmed supply. And that's where you saw supply chain bottlenecks, labor shortages, commodity price increases, as well as the, you know, the war in Ukraine really drove uh, an acceleration of prices. And you saw that inflation really start to take effect. So here comes the, the Fed then, right? And they have two mandates. The first mandate is um, to, to drive uh, full employment. And the second one is to control inflation. And that's where, you know, they really started to get aggressive with uh, increasing uh, interest rates in order to um, address inflation, right? Um, and with that, we saw that the, the cost of borrowing increased, right? Money was no longer cheap. Um, and what we've seen from that is an impact on the stock market. I, mean, I think we've all seen, you know, the, the hit, um, you know, perhaps in our 401ks, the S&P has been down around 17% year to date. Uh, we've seen tech valuations, you know, uh, uh, down significantly. Many of those, um, you know, tech companies are below their IPO levels um, from the prior year. And it's been a difficult fundraising environment. And the Fed has hiked, you know, interest rates seven times this calendar year, uh, most recently yesterday, where they increased interest rates a uh, half a percent. Um, and, and the reason why is that although we are seeing, you know, inflation start to ease, it's still um, quite stubborn um, and um, we see it every day. Right. Um, as I looked at, you know, some interesting data points, the price of eggs is up 49 percent from a year ago, milk up 15 percent, electricity 14 percent up a year ago, uh, the price of chicken up 12 percent. Um, which is actually kind of interesting. The price of eggs is up 49%, but the price of chicken is up only 12%. If somebody can explain why there's such a difference, I'd love to know. Um, but that being said, you know, we are seeing, uh, you know, prices uh, increase um, and we're seeing sort of real average hourly earnings um, effectively flatter down, you know, year over year. So as we sort of see that shifting economy happening in 2022, you know, what can we expect um, as we enter 2023? And, and looking ahead, you know, I think, you know, there'll be a couple of things, you know, you'll see uh, growth slowing. Um, there's quite a bit of consensus around uh, an, a recessionary environment. You know, as we, as we head into 2023, we'll likely see, you know, unemployment um, increasing. Uh, and we're already starting to see that a little bit um, in certain sectors like uh, the technology sector. Uh, where you're seeing a lot of headlines around uh, layoffs. Um, and what you'll end up seeing is, is a bias of companies towards profitability. So it's no longer going to be a growth on all costs uh, type of environment. Um, and with that, you know, you'll probably see, you know, earnings revisions, um, you know, downward revisions on earnings expectations. You'll see uh, budget scrutinized, which is really kind of a, a key topic for today, which is, okay, you've got some a project that you believe is going to be have a, a real impact on on your business. Um, and it's going to be super important, you know, those projects that are going to drive either cost savings, accelerated uh, innovation, reduce risks or drive impact to your, you know, your top line or your, your profitability. Those are the ones that are going to get support, right, from not only your CFO, but but the business at large. Um, and with that, you know, I think we'll end up seeing is certain sectors are going to be more resilient, right, than others. And one sector, you know, that we believe uh, is, is going to be pretty strong in this uh, environment where you have interest rates increasing is the financial services sector. 
Um, and in, in Fiserv, you know, that is an area that spends a lot of money on, on technology. Um, you know, we're approach, they're approaching roughly $100 billion per year of spend. Um, and we also are seeing, um, you know, the big banks um, spending a lot. So, they're, so they are driving a ton of investment. Um, as an example, J.P. Morgan Chase, you know, announced recently that they're going to be spending $12 billion on technology. Um, so, you know, one of the things we'll talk about is, well, what are they spending their money on and why um, and how you can, um, you know, work with your company to be competitive uh, in that space. I and mean, before I'll, I'll turn it over to Ariel to get his perspective on, you know, what are the trends happening in the financial services sector? Um, I, I'd like to do a quick poll um, and hand it back over to David and get us a, a sense of, you know, from, from the audience as to, you know, how much do, does your company spend annually on IT relative to some of these big banks? Absolutely. Yeah, I want to call everyone's attention to the poll that's on the screen. Um, you answer right there in the slides window. Just select the option that corresponds to you and your IT spend at your company. There are uh, hundreds of thousands, millions, hundreds of millions, or billions. Uh, this will be interesting because I'll share the results of this here in just a moment. And you can kind of see how you stack up with your peers who are on the event, uh, who are on the event, and also, you know, the big banks that um, John was just talking about. So I'll give everyone a moment to answer this. I see a number of responses already. Thank you for those. Let's get just a few more. All right, excellent. Thank you for all the responses. We'll have a few other polls here coming up in the event as well. And if I share out the results, it looks like 44% uh, said hundreds of thousands, 44% said millions. Uh, and 7% said hundreds of millions, 3% said billions. Uh, John, what's your take? Uh, probably a little bit of what I expected, you know, in terms of, of um, most companies are not spending at the, the level of, of a, for instance, a JPMC uh, spending in the billions. Um, and all the more reason why, you know, we'll go into well, how do you stay competitive against some of those big banks? Um, and, and with that, um, maybe I'll turn it over to Ariel and, and get his perspective on you know, what are what are financial services companies investing in and why? Um, awesome. Thank you for that, John. Um, so, yes, I mean, twelve billion dollars is a lot of money. Um, and, you know, people can ask themselves, well, where is all that going and how do you know that it's being well spent? Obviously, when JPMC first announced that, I know that investors and the markets were immediately questioning, hey, is this the right decision? Uh, I think, thankfully, we've seen uh, the, you know, the, the CEO be able to explain that very clearly and well to the market. It's what you need to stay competitive. Um, and, you know, well, where does it go, right? Uh, so there are many places where this goes. I mean, obviously, the first part is these are big places. Just keeping the lights on is a big bill. And these are things like uh, keeping your existing systems running, operating them, but also even, and I consider this in the keep the lights on bucket, just even the improving the efficiency of those existing systems, tweaking out optimizations and making sure that they're running as effectively as possible. Um, there's also, you know, my, starting to migrate to the cloud while, you know, I don't put those in the bucket of innovation. There's, those are things and just how to keep up with the Joneses these days. And it, and it becomes more and more part of just, just the core and keeping those lights on, but my, moving to the cloud become more efficient, ideally prep you to become more neat and more nimble, um, improve your resiliency. Um, they're also investing in new systems and upgrading their infrastructure, again, maintaining the house. And that alone is a big part of the budget. But, you know, that's not really um, where, where, where they're focusing. Um, where, where, and actually, I'm going to take it back just two slides. Sorry about that. I'm going to keep it here. Um, but, you know, they're really uh, investing on how do they differentiate uh, from, their, from their competitors and how do they innovate, right? Uh, on one side, you've got fintechs, smaller companies, startups. Um, nibbling at their heels, right? Coming up with new ideas, new ways of engaging, and moving really fast, um, and and keeping, you know, to a degree, keeping these big banks on their toes. Um, on the other side, you've got powerhouses, the fangs, that are encroaching what used to be a traditional safe financial services space. And what makes that interesting is the fact that 
you know, these fangs have a DNA, a culture of innovation, of moving fast. They've honed their processes and their, and their tooling and the way they think and the way they work to really move fast and take advantage of opportunities as quickly as they appear. Um, they have lots of cash, even in today's, in today's uh, market, even in today's economic climate. climate. Many of them are still sin- sitting on mountains of cash ready to be deployed. The other piece that, you know, that financial services also understand is that these, these things and even the fintechs are a lot less regulated. So they can move a lot more quickly. They can move with, with a lot less restrictions. So banks know that because of this, they have to heavily invest on differentiation and innovation because they're getting hit from every direction and feel a little bit constrained when it comes to how they do it because of the, the regulations. So, you know, where do they focus to really differentiate and innovate? You know, a, a key thing that, that we're seeing is that to a degree, financial services is becoming a little more commoditized where, you know, a checking account at one bank is just like a checking account at another bank and my savings in this bank. So how do banks compete these days, um, especially in a market where um, growth growth at all costs isn't the biggest thing? And in a market where maybe you have to pull back on your spend, they're really investing on customer experience and on service delivery. That's where you differentiate. So what, what does that look like? Um, you know, one big thing that we saw, and you know, it, it aligns with one of the bo- things here on the bottom, is that COVID vastly accelerated digital and mobile adoption. So now that our, our customers, our target markets, are much more comfortable with mobile and web and just you know, digital technologies and interact with you as a business, primarily through digital channels now, um, this is where these companies are investing. And they're investing heavily on how to improve that experience, how to make that experience seamless. They're also improving their ability to service these customers across any channel, whether omni-channel, cross-channel, but being always on so that customers have access to their accounts, to their financial uh, statements, to you know, and, and can service their needs anywhere, anytime. So that means that they must be available and, and have a seamless transition between the physical world, my mobile device, the ATMs, the branch experience, the credit card experience, the shopping experience. They need to be everywhere all at once and be on, and it has to be a seamless experience. So heavily investing on experience, on making this seamless. Um, other areas where they're investing in are things like you know getting really good at fraud and risk management, right? You know, one of the things that uh, financial services firms can do for you is really help you make sure that you know your money is there when you need it and somebody else isn't spending it. So they're investing in technologies that allow them to provide a better fraud experience, a better risk management experience. Um, and a lot of these things are that heavy investments in machine learning and artificial intelligence to spot to spot things that look out of or the ordinary, things that look out of place, to reduce that need to ask you, hey, was this you? If they can get better at understanding how you behave, they can get better at understanding what things look like it was you or wasn't you. They're also investing heavily in you know, partnering with these fintechs. Yes, the fintechs are nibbling at their heels, but it doesn't mean that they're the enemy. In many ways, these banks have you know, these massive cash hoards, and they're using them to not only integrate to these fintechs to accelerate the ability to deliver some of these differentiating capabilities, but they're also investing in these fintechs as partners, building out those technologies and really see if they work out. These become test beds for new ideas that become a low risk way of testing out new ideas. They're experimenting with these fintechs to eventually determine whether they integrate them completely or not. Um, another area that you know banks are investing in these days is, you know, and this comes a lot from this challenge from the FANGs is they're trying to get better at facilitating commerce. So you might see places that some banks are, are buying companies that that aren't in the financial services, might be buying travel companies, might be buying restaurant companies. Uh, and in, at the end of the day, it seems like they're working on how to create a cohesive end-to-end experience and be with you along every step of the journey when you're trying to make a big purchase, a small purchase, they're there to help you make that, you know, make that purchase and, and make it better for you and then make it easy for your funds to be available for that purchase. Um, they've also been investing in some, you know, a, a little more on the more innovative side on things, you know, blockchain. As much as maybe certain banks might talk negatively about cryptocurrencies, they're also bullish on the blockchain itself and what it can do, primarily when it comes to facilitating and simplifying settlements. Right. You know, these days, it's amazing that in today's age, I trade an equity and it still takes me three days to settle that. Right. Um, So things like that, improving settlements with with blockchain money, moving money more efficiently and effectively using blockchain technologies. They're investing in that, again, to improve that experience, to make it to make things settle faster, to make it easier for the end user. 
And even they're investing, you know, even, whether it's 5% of their time, 1% of their time, they're looking further out, right? Even things like quantum computing, that might seem like the realm of, of physicists. It might seem like the realm of like the Googles and the AWSs, but there's a lot at stake when it comes to, you know, being ahead of the game when it comes to quantum computing, at the minimum, protecting yourself from, from things that will change the quantum world, like encryption technology, but also figuring out what innovative new solutions they can come uh, that, that can come from being able to harness the power of quantum computing. Yeah, and, and you know, it's interesting during, you know, it might seem counterintuitive, but during an economic downturn, it, it's often the, the best time, right, to, to invest in transforming your business, as many of these large banks are doing. Um, Ara, what are, what are your thoughts on investing in tools and people now? Uh, thanks. Um, and yes, you know, th there's a lot actually that you can be doing now. And it, again, it seems counterintuitive. You're right. The biggest things I think that you can be investing on right now is optimizing your bottom line. You start there, right? You know, there's ways to think about how to optimize your bottom line. Like you, you work on where are your costs coming from. You know, are we the most productive? What can improve our productivity? Um, and you know, how can we we be more efficient, right? The the reason to in, you know focus on these things first, I think, is you know, as John alluded to before, um, growth at all costs is no longer the way to grow. And people want to look at that you have sustainable, scalable growth. And efficiency is a big part of that. Um, so focusing on efficiency is, is huge. And there's certain metrics and there are big metrics here that you can look at. And I'll talk about those in a bit. But the main reason to focus on efficiency first is that with that kind of investment, you can actually see it pay for itself faster. So if you hit the bottom line, the investment in the tool or the people, the processes pays for itself, buying you a lot of room for many, many other interesting things. And it takes certain skills. You have to develop certain skills to get really good at moving these metrics. So first I'll talk about the metrics themselves, right? And this is, this is not an exhaustive list. You might want to focus on your retention rate for your customers, right? You know, and this is because it's easier to keep a customer than it is to acquire a customer. And it's also a lot more expensive to acquire a customer. So Working on what you can do to fix the bottom of that bucket and that leaky bucket, ha, you know, has massive pay you know, payoff and returns. Looking at your cost to serve, how do you figure out that right mix of digital tools, physical tools, and different servicing capabilities to uh, vastly improve your cost to serve? Digital digitalization goes a long way in that. Um, looking at your lifetime value um, uh, to customer acquisition cost ratio, right, is how good are we getting at reducing the cost to acquire the customer, and at the same time, how, are we, how good are we getting at uh, increasing the value gained from each of those customers, right? That ratio really helps you figure out, are you doing a good job at that? Um, failed customer interactions is one that many people might not have uh, looked at or thought about, but that's really a major experience one, right? It's uh, every time a customer tries to do something, did they fail? And even the simplest way to look at this is, you know, how many errors are they seeing when they try to complete a transaction in your application, right? That's a failed customer interaction, and that has you know many downstream effects on how a customer perceives you, and a massive impact on experience. Uh, and then lastly, I'll mention you know average revenue per user per account, right? That helps you maintain the the top line idea of it. Are we getting better and better at improving how much revenue each customer generates? Um, I highlight these because when you look at these metrics, and I really want to talk about metrics, uh, the muscle that you build during a downturn downturn is how do I, what are the different things I can do to move each of these? What are the practices? What are the skills that allow me to make sure that I can incrementally and continually create a movement in each of these? Um, that's, you know, there's practice in accelerating how you're learning, accelerating how you're deriving insights, continually testing, validating, experimenting, and seeing which things move metrics, which things don't move metrics, so that you can maximize the value at the end of the day out of every single decision you're making. Uh, and the key reason to do that now, now that we're in a downturn is if you get really good at optimizing your efficiency metrics, optimizing your productivity metrics, you get at least two things out of that. One, that skill set, the skill set that it takes to continually move things, continually test things, continually validate. But like I said before, you start paying, for, it starts paying for yourself. Uh, this, this investment starts paying for itself. And then when we do come to a turn in the market, when the market finally improves, uh, not only are you in the position to scale faster and more quickly because you're a much leaner shop, but you've also built those skills that are necessary to then say, great, how do we optimize the top line? How do we optimize revenue? How do we optimize for the things that allow me to grow and grow faster? Because you've been building that skill set throughout this entire downtime, focusing on costs. Now you're going to focus it more 
on revenue, on gains, on acquisition. Um, and, you know, this is what you're working on. And at some point, you know, you're going to have to be able to get somebody to invest in this, right? So the key thing that you're learning, that you're going to be learning through this space is how to get more efficient, right? How do you deliver faster? Um, how much risk am I reducing? It's important to keep thinking about these metrics and the things that are helping us because that'll make that conversation with your CFO much easier. Uh, and, you know, uh, you know uh, with that, uh, you know, I'll hand it over back to, uh, uh, to John. Great. Thanks, Ariel. All right. So I'm going to just cover, you know, real, real quickly here is what are the top five things to get your CFO support, right? Um, and, you know, CFOs often don't like to be surprised. Right. And we, we often, you know, don't like to say no all the time. We'd like to say yes, but there are things that you can do to get the yes, you know, from a CFO. Um, and it's it's really in, in five areas, um, five major areas. The first is when to make that ask. Right. So um, there's a natural cadence to a company um, in, in terms of how they plan and how they invest. Right. And so you have uh, natural sort of in planning and investment cycles in your, your particular organization. Often companies are they have what they call as an annual operating plan where they're they're setting the priorities of the company, um, expectations on how they're going to grow, what areas are they going to make investments in. Um, and that annual operating plan um, oftentimes will get revisited you know, throughout the year, typically halfway through the, the year, they'll take a look at how are we progressing against that plan? Um, and um, are there any adjustments we want to make? So you want to kind of get in front of some of those planning cycles. And also, if you're a, a public company, um, you know, in, my, in past experiences, we, we've I've had to give quarterly guidance to, to Wall Street, right? And you're kind of setting expect, expectations of, you know, how much you're going to, going to be earning from a revenue standpoint, what your profitability is going to be. And, and once you're making that guidance to, to Wall Street, those investments have already been locked down, right? So it's often very difficult to get investment approved after the fact. So just keep in mind as to what your cadence is with inside of your, your company in terms of planning and get in front of that. Um, that's, that's the first one. The second one would be um, is really focus on what are those in, in metrics that you're going to impact, right? RIL mentioned a number of those metrics uh, that are, are extremely important. And so if you're going to be impacting, for instance, the top line of revenue, you know, identify what those investments are, whether it's a conversion metric of free to paid, you know, as RIL mentioned, retention or revenue per account, or even um, a metric around, um, you know, how much you're going to potentially reduce you know, downtime of your application that has a direct impact on potentially revenue, right? Um, are you reducing infrastructure costs, right? Um, what is that metric that you might be, you know, impacting? That might be your gross margin, or, you know, your, you know, your, your gross profitability. Um, or are you increasing, for instance, your software develop, delivery cycles, you know, per engineer that might end up manifesting itself in, a lower uh, engineering, you know, research and development operating expense as a as a percentage of revenue. So really keying on those metrics is going to be great. Um, obviously, a discrete investment um, and quantifying that is going to be really important. You know, how much is it going to cost, you know, in terms of headcount, um, you know, whether it be headcount or um, programmatic investment costs, you know, are they one time costs or they're going to be ongoing? Just having a real clear quantification of that investment is going to be very important. And then also the return. When do you expect to see that return play out, right? And for how long? And the one thing I'll, I'll, I'll just convey to, to the participants is the way that you can, um, you know, convey how those metrics ultimately impact the financial statements. And I'll talk a little about financial statements here. Um, but really um, identifying how you're going to impact the financial statements is going to be hugely critical, right, of getting the CFO's buy-in. Um, so what are those financial statements? So you've got your income statement, um, also, often also called a, a P&L or profit and loss, right? And that's basically describing as to, you know, what your profit uh, and or losses are um, for your particular company. So, you know, it would be akin to how much personally you're you're receiving in terms of you know earnings and what your expenses are and are you actually driving profit 
you know, relative to you know, your earnings and, and, and costs? Um, or are you, are you driving a, a, a loss? Um, your cash flow statement would basically just be um, monitoring what are you spending and or earning in a particular period. So a case, in, you know, it'd be akin to, let's say you um, have a, a bill that you receive, you know, personal finances, you incur that cost, you know, in December, but you don't pay out that bill until January. That cash flow statement basically just monitors when is cash coming in and when is cash coming out the door, right? And finally, your balance sheet um, is really a, a, a snapshot as to what are your, you know, your assets versus your liabilities and your equity. So this would be akin to um, your assets per, in personal finance would be potentially how much cash you have in the bank would be an asset, right? A liability might be, um, you know, your mortgage, right? That you're paying, that you're paying down. And the equity could be potentially, you know, the, the equity that you have in your home. Right. And so similar to your personal finances, a company will have their own sort of balance sheet or snapshot as to, you know, what their their assets versus liabilities and equity is. So really understanding, you know, what metric you're going to be driving, how that's going to ultimately impact the um, financial statements is going to be really important. Right. Of getting your CFOs buy in. And with that, um, you know, why don't we pause and I'll, I'll kick it back over to David and we'll have our second poll question. Absolutely. I just brought up a poll on the screen for everyone out there. Uh, the question is, if you can impact an area of the financial statements, what area would excite the CFO the most? Is it revenue, gross margin percent, net income, cash from operations, total assets, uh, or total assets? Those are the options there on the screen. Uh, so could be tough. You got to pick one. What is the area that would most excite the CFO? I see some responses coming in. Thank you for those. Let's get just a few more. And I think these are great questions for, you know, technology people to think about because, you know, being a former IT manager myself, you know, we might not spend as much time thinking about our impact on the financial statement as much as we think about the technology. So these are good things to think about. All right, lots of good responses coming in. Let me go ahead and share the results. And the leader here is uh, net income at 37%, followed closely by gross margin percent. Uh, John, what do you think? Uh, this is interesting, right? Uh, and I guess what I'll say is, it really depends. And so the answer is it's, there's not one specific metric that will excite the, the CFO the most. Um, it depends, right? It depends on the company. Um, but it's not surprising to see that net income uh, is sort of hitting the top of the list, right? Um, if you were to sort of rewind maybe a few years ago, revenue might have been the, the, the leading metric that most people would have identified um, because that was an era where um, more value was placed on growing your top line. Whereas today, you know, you might be looking at, well, we want to actually drive profitability and net income on your, your income statement, your PL is what is at the end of the day, what is your profit? Right. Um, but it's really going to depend on the company. Um, so, uh, if you're a, a very large fortune, let's say fortune 100 company, you know, you might be really focused on driving net income in earnings. Um, uh, because your top line is relatively uh, stable and predictable, and you're really trying to drive efficiencies. Um, you might be another company where actually, you know, your, your spending is roughly in, in check, right? In terms of your operating expenses, you're hitting your revenue numbers, but your gross margin. So the cost to serve your product is really an area that has the most opportunity, right? Um, so it really depends on the company. Um, but I think this is interesting to see, you know, where sort of the mindset is now shifting, right? It's shifting a little bit more towards profitability and less at growth of all costs. All right. And so with that, maybe we can go back to this slide and, and I'll turn it over to Ariel because I'd love to get, you know, you've received sort of the, the CFO's perspective um, right on how to get buy-in. But from your experience, Ariel, you know, what have you done kind of in your career to help get the, the CFO's buy-in? Um, awesome. Thanks for that, uh, John. Um, I think 
um, you know, this is hard as uh, I think even David mentioned, you know, for technologists, you know, it's not a skill that we tend to learn or practice, meaning speaking about the, the end business impact of uh, our technical changes or technical work uh, often is because the metrics that we move are usually at least uh, two levels removed, right? You might think about business outcomes, step back for a second, maybe product outcomes impact business outcomes, and then product outcomes are impacted by technical outcomes. Often that's usually the way we get to business outcomes, although there are other more direct ways. So you know, it's not something that we get to see very directly and we don't get to you know, practice this muscle uh, and you know, exercise this muscle. Um, but I think the, the, the simplest thing that, that I can suggest as a way that's helped me in the past is you know, leverage ROI calculators, you know, the, the, and an ROI, ROI calculator. Let's say I want to bring in a new product and I believe that this product will impact a set of metrics. Often those vendors might have their own ROI calculators, whether it is on their own website or something that they provide you when you're working and talking to their sales teams um, because they do it themselves, right? They wanna, they wanna help you see the value, leverage those. You know, those will really help you figure out, punch in the right, the, the right parameters and give you an idea of what the ROI will be to facilitate this conversation with your, um, with your CFO. You can also, you know, at the end of the day, your your business is different from other businesses so you can potentially build your own roi cal roi calculator especially even if you focus on the things that you know best technology building technology maintaining technology running technology teams it's amazing how many costs build up there very very quickly and in the simplest term you know sometimes you think about how many how many how many minutes am i going to save if you have you know 100 engineers and you save 5 minutes across those 100 engineers and then do that every month for the year, that compounds very quickly and engineers are very expensive. If you think about your operating costs, right? Um, uh, you can think about direct costs and what it costs you to run something. Um, you can think about how many less people you might need to implement something. So headcount, headcount translates into dollars and cents at the end of the day. So there's still a lot you know, at, that you have at hand that is you know, more direct to, in terms of the way you work that you can use to calculate and come up with a number on this is the amount of financial impact we will have. Um, so you can go and build out your own uh, your your own uh, ROI calculator. And yes, you know there's also the initial cost for the particular thing you're looking to do, whether it's process or or, or a new product. You can think about how long it'll take you to, to get value. Obviously, if you look at a freemium product, that makes it a lot easier, right? Let's start let's start testing an idea with a freemium product. So that might also make it easier. But I think at the end of the day, the most important part that you need to remember and understand is this. You are not alone, and you're obviously not expected to be an expert on, on financial statements. That's why this is a partnership with your CFO. Your CFO wants to say yes, leverage them, and when you come up with your calculations, they'll help you review them, but there's things that they know how to do from an accounting perspective that you'll have never have any idea about. So don't be afraid that if your number looks too big, that they'll never go for it, because they might be able to figure out more creative ways saying, well, from an accounting perspective, we can realize these costs now, or we can realize these costs later. We can realize the the income now. There are different ways to make that work in the financial calendar that I can't even you know take a stab at understanding. But your CFO definitely does. So the closer you partner with your CFO, the better you can come up with an actual solution that works for both of you. So at the end, don't be scared to present something that looks too big. Lean heavily on the things that you know well and how you might impact numbers. And then that partnership with your CFO will help you understand other areas where you're not thinking about. Um, with that said, I think, you know, I want to move on to now another poll um, because we're going to start talking about assuming you get that buy-in uh, and you're ready to go, you're still going to hit new stumbling, stumbling blocks. Uh, and this is one of the biggest stumbling blo blocks. So uh, I'll hand the poll over to David now. Yeah, the poll that we just brought up on the screen for everyone out there. This is the last poll on the event. I want to call your attention to it. The question is, what is the hardest part of getting a tool adopted in your organization? Is it just the resistance to change? Nobody wants to move to a new tool. It's too painful. Is it risk aversion? You know, like we might have downtime or uh, impact to our applications by moving to this tool. Is it, you know, having people just understand the value of the tool? Uh, or is it all of the above? Uh, this one, you can choose all of the above, but if there's, you know, specific uh, option here that's, uh, much more applicable to your organization, then please select it. And we do want to get your feedback on this. I'll share the results here in just a moment. Let's get a few more responses.
All right. Thank you to everyone who responded. Let me go ahead and share the results out. And it looks like a big winner here. 72% said all of the above, followed by 20% who said simply resistance to change. Uh, Ariel, what do you think? Um, I mean, th this aligns very well. I mean, obviously, you know, all of the above tells us that look, these are big problems for everyone. And often um, all of these are the hardest parts. Like they're all very hard. Um, but it's also telling that, you know, resistance to change is the one that 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 most people identify as uh, as an individual one. Um, and and that that's a massive part of implementing anything. Resistance, you know, it, it's amazing how many people don't want to change for many reasons, whether they're comfortable, um, whether they're, you know, whether change is difficult, whether um, they don't know how to do it. You know, that's one of the biggest things. Resistance to change is massive. So I think this aligns very perfectly with what I would expect. So I think now I'll transition over to talking about, you know, um, how do we manage change? Because that's the biggest part, right? Um, managing change, you know, it, it is a very difficult, uh, a very difficult thing to do, especially the bigger, the bigger and bigger your organization is. Um, and it doesn't, it often doesn't even matter <clears throat> how much impact the particular uh, solution has. It doesn't matter if your CFO agrees and buys in. It will not be successful unless you actually have, you know, really strong skills and practices in implementing the particular tool, the particular process. Uh, the particular solution because you need to get people using it you need to get it to work um, if i were to highlight you know three particular things that really stand out to me um, in, in terms of helping this transition uh, the first one is uh, if you find a solution that is very easy to use that is self-explanatory and allows the people in the organization to self-serve um, i think it vastly uh, lowers that bar uh, for how to get people getting value fast right so the, the easier to use they are, the, the more self-service they are, that means less investment, less time needed for handholding, less time and effort needed for training and education. Not that they're not needed, but a lot less because people can figure it out and discover it on their own. And it's amazing how quickly people start finding value in new ways to use things when they use it more directly or hands-on uh, and, they, and, and, and they find it very easy to use. The second thing that becomes extremely important is, um, you know, creating a culture of cheerleaders and fans. And, you know, what does that mean? You can't do it by yourself, right? The sooner you can identify who your internal champions are, the sooner you can identify the people that are bought in and really are gung ho and either A, will gain the most value from this or 100% agree with, you know, with your approach and the solution, uh, the more power you'll have to, and the more leverage you'll have to really move this message forward, amplify the message, and test it in more places and really implement it in more and more areas, you really get to penetrate the organization by leveraging these champions and enabling them and empowering them. So that's a massive part here. Find these champions and then work with them to really amplify uh, the impact. And the last part is, it's tied a little bit to the first one is, uh, never stop experimenting. And this, this ties very heavily to the resistance to change idea and the risk aversion. Um, it's important to couch many changes uh, as an experiment, right? You know, I think often when you introduce a brand new change, a big change, uh, people immediately step back, no, that's going to be difficult. No, that's too hard. No, that will have too much impact. Um, but as soon as you say, hold on, wait, it, it'll just be an experiment, people tend to soften a bit because they, 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 they tend to, you know, um, uh, connect experiments and, and with the idea that, oh, it's temporary. It's small. The impact radius is, is, is minimized. So, Couching these changes experiments and testing different ideas, different ways to implement, and the champions come into play here, um, allows you to, in a low risk fashion, try out new ways, try out what works for you, and do it in several areas so you can accelerate your learning on what works and what doesn't work and leverage all those people while doing it in a low risk fashion. And, you know, what is an experiment? It's obviously something that has a hypothesis, right? This is what I think will come out of this change. Um, it has an end date, and that's the big thing that really reduces that that has it, the hesitance, uh, uh, the hesitation. It, it's only going to be for a month. It's only going to be for three months, and it has success criteria. And we expect that after the end of the three months, we're going to see these impacts. Couching it in those terms makes it easier to get buy-in from those people internally who are going to be affected by the change, and allows you to test the ideas in a low-risk fashion. Um, obviously, there are many other practices that you can put into place. Um, to really accelerate uh, the, the the implementation and the uptake, but these three ones really stand out to me. Um, now, once you start implementing, you start getting these in, uh, 
the last step that I want to cover, and we talked about earlier on when, why would you invest now? And you're investing in the muscle on getting good at moving metrics. You're getting good at moving uh, your cost metrics, your product metrics, your efficient, your productivity metrics, your efficiency metrics. That all really, really hits the bottom line. These skills that you've learned, these skills that, that, that you've gotten now actually prep you to really hit the top line. Right. And, and, you know, what do you do to, to then, you know, accelerate your ability to affect the top line? Um, there, 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 these are investments that you make during this downtime. And as you're coming out of it, um, primarily on enabling your teams to really run with this, to really run with these skills that they've learned, run with these capabilities that they've learned and apply them everywhere, apply them to everything we do, how we do these things uh, so that they can better impact those top line metrics. So to me, the, the key things that stand out when you think about where to invest is number one, providing your teams with autonomy, right? And again, autonomy is not just a, it, it's sometimes difficult for us to think about how to let our teams make decisions, right? Um, it means letting go of some control, but um, autonomy, you know, self-organizing, self-directed teams, um, teams that work with psychological safety, that means that they, they can try out new things, they might trip and fall, but there's a lot of trust that's built. When you give teams autonomy, um, it's amazing the kind of things that they come up with, the kind of, the kind of ideas that, 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 that uh, come to play and allows them to move fast and test things. And remember, they've learned these skills by optimizing for cost and efficiency. Now they're working on optimizing insights. They're optimizing new technologies, new solutions. They're optimizing ways of impacting the top line. Uh, the second thing that becomes crucial and absolutely crucial to enabling this is open access to data. Without data, without analytics, without the ability to understand where the problems are and the impact we're having is very, very difficult to make the right decisions. So high, you know, highly visible data and analytics shared across silos, right? Removing these silos um, enable data-driven decision-making, right? And as long as I can see my KPIs and I see my metrics, I see what things have moved them in the past and I can see what's moving them now, that can only vastly uh, improve my ability to make the right decisions and my ability to pivot when something's not working because I can see it. You know, it's amazing how much time is spent having to go to an external team, to an analytics team, to a reporting team to go get feedback. If that takes two weeks, it's very difficult to apply these changes. Uh, and the last bit here is I think a, a commitment to ongoing education over people, continually training them, uh, educating them, building and maintaining expertise and committing to their personal growth uh, pays off massive dividends, Getting, making them better at their jobs, making them better in the product, making them better at how they optimize metrics. All these things pay massive dividends uh, when it comes to these teams, to these teams experimenting with ideas and testing ideas. So with that, you know, I, I'd like to, you know, conclude and, and wrap it up and talk about, you know, what we've learned uh, and what came out of this. Um, if you only take away three things, uh, it, it would be these. Uh, an economic downturn can create opportunities for financial services firms and highly regulated organizations to learn and practice, you know, how to move like these smaller, newer, more nimble organizations, right? These fintechs that are nibbling at your heels. How can you learn to move like them and then practice that skill of moving like them? At the same time, you don't want, want to be left behind uh, in an econ economic downturn by these large orgs making, making massive investments. So if you learn how to invest like them, what are the right places to invest and where they're investing, that also helps you out massively here. And lastly, start today, immediately, now. Just like you think about investing, you know, you know, or even trees, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago, the second best time is now. Start today, find what is the right solution for you, the right, the right implementation for you. Look for freemium models if you can, makes it much easier to, to implement uh, and because they allow you to take a look and get buy-in uh, and implement them in your organizations. With that said, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, John, for all the insights on understanding the financial background and you know what stands out to you. Um, with that, I'll hand it over back to David. Absolutely, yeah, great presentation. I, I learned a lot. I know the audience did as well. Uh, we've got uh, some great uh, calls to action there on the wrap-up slide. I encourage you to check out. Um, I also want to make sure everyone is aware of the handouts tab again. There's links there to book a demo, start your free trial. There's the FinServe ebook and the WePay case study you can all download here while we do our Q&A. So if you have a, a question, now's the time to get it in uh, because we're kicking off Q&A now uh, with this first question here that came in from Heath. Uh, he says, 
when spending to improve efficiency, the quality of money spent is more important than the quantity of money spent. Uh, generally, what are the best areas that offer the best return on investment? Uh, who wants to take that one? Um, John, do you want to take that one or? Yeah, yeah happy to. Uh, it's a great question, Heath. Um, you know, today, uh, every dollar does matter, right, in terms of that investment. Um, and and the, it's going to be, you know, likely more scrutinized, right, in terms of, of where you're going to be placing that investment. Um, as kind of back to that poll, right, asked where, where, where would you want to make place those investments to see that return? Again, it really depends on the company and what aspects of the business model they are trying to improve the most. OK, so that might be an area of driving more revenue. It could be on the gross margin side where you're trying to improve, you know, your cost to deliver your platform or it could be on your operating expenses. Um, so I don't have a, a specific answer to you, but it would be good to reflect on, you know, and ask your CFO, uh, ask them, you know, what aspects of our business model do we need to improve the most? What are areas where Wall Street, for instance, might be looking for you to make those improvements um, to really give you, uh, you know, a potential to get, for instance, um, you know, a higher rating from that, you know, that that third party um, or a, a stock, um, you know, recommendation, you know, whether it's it's a, 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 a private company or a public company, every company has an aspect of their business model that they're trying to improve. So understanding that you'll know where to invest. Great advice. Uh, here's another good one. Uh, they're asking, what if we have a tool in place, but we aren't utilizing it fully? How can we grow into our tech stack during this time? Uh, Ariel, is that for you? Um, yep, yeah, I'll take that one. Um, I think the, the first question is thinking about how self-service, how easy the tool is to use, right? And I think there is, you know, trying to get more people to use it and they'll, they'll, they'll learn more from it. But um, that's not always the case, I think. But often many companies have, you know, amazing customer success teams, right? They have amazing um, uh, LMSs and, you know, self-service tools for learning, but also even guided training and stuff like that. You know, speak to your vendor partner, speak to the, you know, speak to the company that, that runs the product and see what they're able to do here to, you know, to uh, facilitate enablement, to facilitate uh, helping not only your existing users understand how to get more value, but also running training sessions and, and, and running uh, seminars to help them understand the value, how to use it and how to continually learn about it. I think the beauty of this is if these companies offer this and it's part of the product, it's already part of the product. So get the value out of it, right? It doesn't mean that you're spending the time, you're not spending the money. You've already bought it, leverage them and they're, that's what they're there for. So I think that, that's what I'd say to look for um, if, if it's possible and if it's available for your product. Excellent. And then here's another good one. How do we secure adoption within the organization if it's a large organization? Uh, they say, I'm good with getting my team up and running, but I can't secure universal buy-in to change processing overall. Uh, any advice on getting buy-in? Um, I can take that one. I've, I've dealt with this many times, having worked in the past. And I didn't talk about my past experience, but I've worked at, at massive organizations. Um, as, as many of you may know, in a large organization, things move a lot more slowly uh, for many reasons, right? Um, one of the best tactics that I've seen work for me, and actually, no, it's a strat more of a strategy, is um, working on two fronts, which is convincing the, the larger part of the organization that has to make the decision, that has to finalize that, we need this and we should have this. But knowing that that's going to take them a year or two to implement, and that's just the reality of large organizations, at the same time, offering up the idea of, I'll be more than happy to be a test bed for this, right? Can you allow me the time and space to test it in my space, right? So we can prove that it might make sense at the larger org while you're looking at what does it look like to implement, you know, uh, organization-wide. If you let me be a test bed and validate so that you run with it, what, do you, what, what are the success criteria that you need to see um, so that you feel like this is worthwhile pursuing uh, so that we can go and run with this? So that allows you to put it in their minds you kind of re create a reverse experiment. I'm saying, let's go try an experiment to change you. It's like, I'm going to be the experiment, but here's what you need to see in my experiment. And you kind of get a win-win because you get to try the new thing for your team, run with it, but you also get to prove that it works or prove that actually it doesn't work. Um, so I think hitting them on those two fronts uh, can go a long way. 
Very wise advice. And this is a good one. Speaking of testing, what's a good first test to run to show a feature management system would work for us? That's a good one. Um, so uh, I, I would I would think that when it comes to feature management, in terms of a good first test is just for showing that it works, right? That, that, that's a simple one. So what do I mean by that? Um, the ability to show that I can enable or disable something remotely without a deployment and see it in my real live app in someone's hands, that's massive, right? I think that gets you past that first hurdle of, does it work? Um, if you really wanna see the best test, and here's a challenge in terms of, it's not a test that you can force. And ideally it's a situation that you don't want to occur, but it becomes a, a prime opportunity to prove uh, to prove its worth. Meaning, uh, what I mean by that is, uh, it's never never let a good crisis go uh, go to waste. Is if you find that first example where something goes wrong, there's an incident, there's a there's a problem in production, uh, and you just show that I flip a switch and I disabled it and I immediately remediated that issue in seconds. That's that golden opportunity, right? That is that test that will show everybody this is worth this is worth its weight in gold this thing works and we can't imagine a world without this the challenge with that is obviously you can't run that test right so you're hoping that it doesn't happen but you're kind of also hoping that it does happen the beauty of, uh, of it at the end is that if it does happen you can remediate very quickly i like it it sounds like a great opportunity for a lot of companies out there um, i think this is a great place to to wrap up here we're out of time in our webinar event. Uh, John, Ariel, it's been great having you on. Thank you so much for your excellent presentation today. Thank, thank you, you very much thanks, for having us. Awesome. And thank you to Split for supporting the event. Uh, again, don't forget to check out the handouts tab there to book your own personal demo with Split or start a free 30-day trial. We also have a free ebook and case study there for download. So make sure you grab those assets here while you can. Um, I do want to now announce the winner of our Amazon $300 gift card. This is going out to Michael Wary from Illinois. Congratulations, Michael Wary from Illinois. We'll reach out to you to deliver that. And we'll also reach out to our best question prize winner as well. Thank you to everyone who joined us on the webinar today. Take care and we'll see you on the next event. Have a great day. Bye-bye.